All right, thanks for joining us for the second installment of the public panel series on uh, authors who are publishing with the Journal of Free Speech Law. My guest today is Alan Rosenstein, uh, professor of law at University of Minnesota, and also editor at, or maybe senior editor, I don't know, I forget your title, at Lawfare, <laughs> and an overall very interesting and smart uh, guy who I learn from every time we chat for even just a, a few minutes. Um, so, Alan, uh, we have a few attendees, and I'll, 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 tell, I'll let them know that if you have questions, you can go ahead and use the chat. Don't use the Q&A because I'm not going to be paying attention to it, but you could also raise your hand, and toward the end of our time here, um, we, can, we can let you ask a, a live question. But I, I think that most of these videos are meant to be um, sort of viewed after the fact. So, um, so we'll go ahead and start with a description of the paper that you wrote for the Journal of Free Speech Law. So for those who've, who attended the first panel, you know that we ran a symp symposium on the topic of platforms, online platforms, and whether, uh, whether under First Amendment law or even just sort of uh, legal principles more generally, they should be thought of as conduits or speakers. Um, and Alan, your paper sort of gets right to the heart of that question by um, arguing that speech technology companies um, should not automatically, at least, be treated as First Amendment speakers. Uh, rather, they are sort of instrumental for the interests that we're ultimately concerned about. So can you lay out the basic argument of your paper and then we'll go into more detail? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, so um, I, the, my problem is that I'm not smart enough to do constitutional law. I get very quickly confused by the doctrinal complexity um, and so what I tend to do when I approach a field like this is I just try to figure out what outcome we're trying to achieve. And then I try to find the simplest doctrinal way there. So a lot of this is me studying First Amendment law and just not being able to understand it, finding it so confusing that I'm trying to find some way to simplify it down. Well, that sounds, your problem there is assuming that there's some sort of internal structure or consistency to con law that you don't understand because you're not smart enough, like as if it's a physics problem. And that is not what's going on. I just want to know. I, that, 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 that may be the case. No, there are, there, there are some scholars that are very sophisticated doctrinal dialecticians. I am, I am not one of those. And so that influences how I view, how I view these sorts of issues. And, and, and so the, the reason I say this is because the, the idea behind my paper is pretty simple, which is um, uh, instead of starting with the doctrine of First Amendment law and trying to apply that to this new category of, um, you, I think you call them speech technology companies, you can call them tech giants, digital companies, it doesn't really matter what we call them, but, but you know, the, the big tech giants that, that we think of and that we used to call the, the fangs before I guess Facebook became meta and now we need a new better acronym. Um, is what are we trying to achieve? And it strikes me that what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to achieve as good of a speech environment as possible. Um, and uh, if you're trying to achieve as good of a speech environment as possible, um, that, is the, uh, that is the basis upon which you want to evaluate all the very many complicated First Amendment arguments that are going to be made by technology companies. Uh, and if you do that across a wide range of areas, whether it's antitrust, content moderation, surveillance, consumer protection, and on and on and on and on. Um, uh, focusing on the idea of what First Amendment rule is going to create a uh, as good of a speech environment for users as possible allows you to cut through a lot of the doctrinal complications that arise when you try to take First Amendment law um, uh, which is usually framed around the idea that certain entities have First Amendment rights, and then try to apply that to giant multinational multi-billion dollar companies. Now, it won't always give you a clear answer to this approach because it involves making guesses about the world and what sort of rule will have what sort of effects, but at least you can focus your energies on what I take to be the really important question, um, the, the rights of uh, users, not companies. And, and uh, for those who have sort of studied First Amendment theory, this is um, in some sense analogous to a um, influential uh, uh, for First Amendment law 
um, that the reason First Amendment law exists is for listeners, not speakers. That's that's sort of one theory, and and that approach has its has its um, uh, problems because when you're talking about individuals, um, actually we do tend to think that individuals have rights as speakers because there's something important about being able to express yourself, right? That's a part of what human flourishing is. But fortunately, once you um, go from speakers to giant, in particular, giant public companies where there is a, according to corporate law, a big distinction between on the one hand, the interests and the rights of the company itself and the interests and the rights of the, the shareholders or the managers and directors, then you don't have to worry so much about the right of a company like Apple to speak. Because of course, Apple doesn't, there is no sentient being called Apple whose autonomy or dignity can be injured. So then you can just focus on the rights of the actual human beings involved. And, and so it, I think it allows for a much cleaner analytical approach to the problem. And so instead of dealing with all the kind of logical complication of, of you know, First Amendment conceptualization, you end up just dealing with, in some sense, equally difficult questions of you know, market structure and sociology and psychology. But like that is theoretically answerable in a way that you know, metaphysical speculation about you know, is Apple a platform or a publisher for First Amendment law, I find to be, um, makes, my, my, makes my head hurt. So I want to avoid doing as much as possible. Right. So, yeah, I mean, so I, I too tend to come from a listener oriented point of view when I think about what the purpose of the First Amendment is. And the nice thing actually about the topic of Internet users and especially social media users, which is kind of one of the core case studies that we're going to talk about today, is that uh, it, it proves why we don't really need to distinguish so much between listeners and speakers the way First Amendment doctrine used to in the broadcast era, because in the broadcast era, speakers were, rel I mean, listeners were relatively passive, um, and the speakers were um, the ones kind of dictating the uh, the terms of engagement, And but, but now we can just look at users, and it kind of combines both of those, but uh, so I, I, I do want to go into some detail about the various problems that we have applying First Amendment to the big Silicon Valley firms in a minute. But first, I want to just pause on your approach to asking First Amendment questions, because one problem I see with it is that you're ultimately just asking what good policy is. And the First Amendment, or at least, you know, some theories of what the First Amendment is doing is finding a rough rule of reason that cuts short some of the otherwise very, um, you know, highly factually specific types of analysis that we do to figure out what, what good public policy is. So do you really mean that in each domain, like let's take antitrust, for example, well, actually, maybe that's the worst example. <laughs> let's pick a different one, <laughs> privacy, <laughs> um, or uh, content moderation rules or something. Um, do we really go all the way back to first principles and ask, you know, for this type of platform and this type of societal interest, we start just from scratch and ask what good policy is? Or does the first, because in that case, it seems like the First Amendment might not, might not do much. Well, I, I think I think the First Amendment, so, so, uh, so, 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 so two, two responses. So, I think even if we were to go back to first principles, that doesn't mean the First Amendment wouldn't do much because the First Amendment can be viewed at minimum as a way of um, how much relative weight to give to certain values rather than others, right? So at, at, the, at the minimum, the First Amendment puts a thumb on certain parts of the scale, right? So, you know, yeah. as interpreted by the Supreme Court from the mid 20th century onwards, because that's always important when you talk about the First Amendment is to caveat the like, there's the First Amendment that the framers wrote and it's like totally, not entirely, which has relatively little to do with the First Amendment as we kind of understand it now, for better or for worse, whatever. Um, but as understood as you know, the mid 20th century First Amendment, um, that has a very strong presumption against um, against censorship, right? And, and we can define you know, that censorship is like a very vague term here, right? Um, but you know, to get a sense of what that means, compare, for example, free speech law in America versus free speech law in Europe, right? Where they have very different conceptions and they take things like hate speech, for example. You know, they 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 take that I don't say more seriously, but they 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 think that um, freedom of expression rights are, are relatively less weak. Yeah. You know, weak compared to that, right? And you know, within a certain zone of you know, we're not talking about North Korea here, right? We're talking about 
liberal democracies and each liberal democracy I think gets leeway within a zone of um, fundamental human rights to kind of pick how much to, to give you know, various um, uh, uh, weight to various factors and therefore each society has its own free expression um, regime and our free expression regime is called the First Amendment regime and it tends to be a little more, it's called libertarian. Okay, mm -hmm. so at, the, at minimum it does that. But, but in addition, you know, I think the, the question you're asking me is, is absolutely right. And, and it, it gets to, I would think a, a lot of debates in law end up being, right? Which is, um, do you wanna use rules or standards? Right, I mean, that, it's, it's amazing how many debates in law and legal theory are just <laughs> variations, like footnotes to rules versus standards, right? <laughs> so again, the, the idea here is that the benefit of a rule is that it has, you know, the, the cleaner and the more bright line the rule is, the easier it is to apply, um, the uh, easier it is to be consistent. Um, if you're worried about slippery slopes, right, the easier it is to resist the urge to go down the slippery slope if you have a rule in front of you, right? But the problem with the rule is that it's inaccurate. That's kind of the whole point. You're, you're, you're making, you're, you're, you're accepting a certain level of, of um, inaccuracy relative to the substantive goals you're trying to achieve, right? Because if you weren't, you wouldn't need the rule. You would just do the thing, right? By contrast, standards, you're actually trying to achieve the ultimate goal, but it, that's of course complicated and therefore the decision costs are greater, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is not, I think, should we use rules or standards, right? It's given the doctrine at a particular time and given the underlying reality at a particular time, is the fit between the doctrine as it exists and the underlying reality sufficiently tight that using a rule is better than using standards. Right. Mm -hmm. And and the thing that I'm and, and, or and better than using an alternative rule, I guess, would be. Well, 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 so so but but the, so the question you asked me, right, was, you know, aren't you just arguing for throwing all the rules out and going back to standards and like, why would we ever want to do that? Right. Isn't the whole point of the First Amendment that we have rules? And, mm -hmm. and I think the first the point of the First Amendment is that we might prefer rules all else all else being equal because they're easier to administrable and can keep us from going down paths we might want to go down. But that's always contingent on the idea that the rule is sufficiently well tracked underlying reality. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'm trying to get at in the paper is that, um, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore. We have, we have a situation that is qualitatively different than in at previous times, you know, in, in, at, at, than at, at, at previous times in, 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 in American constitutional history. Right, because you have so much activity being routed through a small number of giant companies um, in a way that, frankly, goes beyond even the telecommunications companies, um, you know, the big newspapers in the mid 20th century. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to throw all the First Amendment out and, like, um, uh, you know, pretend that this nothing like this has ever happened in the past. But it does strike me as a sign that we should be more willing to depart from current first amendment rules and go back to first principles than okay, you know, got it. and then may, maybe some new rules would emerge after go after going to first principles and using a standard may, maybe we'd have a new set of rules for the new new information environment that we're in i think i think, I think that's right and, and I, I think an example with that would be for example what should um you know what what should uh uh, uh you know defamation law be for large platforms, right? You know, we have a pretty good sense of what, you know, defamation law should be for your traditional newspaper versus for your books, book, bookseller. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to assume that Facebook or Twitter has to fall within that rule, right? Maybe we need to go back to first principles, but then at some point we'll figure out, okay, there'll be a new rule for how you deal with these things called social media platforms. And then we'll just rinse and repeat as technology changes. Yeah, okay. Well, so let's go ahead and, and start with defamation or rather I, I wanted to start anyways with the specific example of section 230 and whether that matches well enough um, what the rough rules, I mean, what, you know, whether that matches the reality of, of what we're trying, you know, whether it matches well enough what we're trying to accomplish in terms of uh, benefits to society for having platforms that are immunized from, say, defamation liability, while also having a quite a free hand to do cleanup. Um, so what do you think of Section 230 in, in general? And you're, you know, you're free to give some specific examples if you'd like. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 
to be perfectly honest, I don't know what I think of Section 230 because um, the effects of changing it are understudied and deeply hyped. So, um, you know, the, the, the current debate about Section 230 has gotten so polarized that it's kind of hard to, um, I think, with any kind of nuance, talk about what will, you know, what will, not, what will or will not happen, you know, if, if, if or not it is changed. Mm-hmm. What, I, what I will say is this, I am broadly convinced by the arguments that, you know, made by people like Anupam Chandra and others, that um, Section 230, when it was enacted in the 90s, um, was a crucial subsidy to the internet and to internet platforms and is part of what allowed them to grow to such immense size um, by giving them a, a shield against a lot of, um, you know, basically defamation, uh, defamation law. Um, now, you know, what's, what's tricky is that what I think the fair reading of what Congress intended Section 230 to accomplish, and what the courts ended up turning Section 230 is different. So, you know, I, I find compelling the argument that what Congress was trying to do in Section 230 was to uh, was to limit publisher liability, but not necessarily to remove distributor liability, as those you know two liabilities under the First Amendment law. And it's the courts in cases like Zoran out of the Fourth Circuit, which then became the dominant interpretation of 230, that that massively expanded 230 scope, right? But they right. Didn't so, think- so just to, yeah. to make sure that it's clear to, to viewers, um, distributor liability basically only applies when the distri- distributor knows, actually knows of defamatory content. And that's why, you know, a bookstore or something, it can't generally be uh, sued for defamation. Um, whereas publisher liability is a little more, I mean, it's, it's pretty close to uh, the same sort of liability that an author, uh, pretty similar to the liability standard that an author has. And so, so you, you believe that Congress intended to maintain distributor liability and cases like Zarin where someone alerts a platform that there is something grievously false being spread about them and has a credible and provides credible evidence of that. Um, they might, they should be able to, you know, uh, under Congress's original intent, maybe they should have been able to have, bring a good claim. Is that? I, I, I think, I think that is, that strikes me as a more plausible piece of statutory interpretation, right? Okay. Yeah. But, but be that as it may, we have this kind of hypercharged 230, 230 immunity. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the question is, um, you know, I, I, I think whether one wants to limit it or not, right, um, is, okay, let me, let me, let me say, let me say, let's say a couple of things. So I do think at this point, the, the companies are large enough that um, they can probably, at least the largest uh, platforms are large enough that they can absorb um, some of the liability that would occur um, were you to carve Section 230 back. And what's important to appreciate is that um, one doesn't have to repeal Section 230 to limit it. One can, for example, clarify that it only um, provides distributor liability. Um, one can Im- create a new standard um, so as to allow uh, um, a way for companies to be notified and then they have right. a grace period, so, you know, similar to how DMCA the you know, sort of. DMCA works, which no one likes, but you know, sort of does the job of well, no preventing. no one likes this either so we're all in, yeah. <laughs> we're in a range of but no, no one likes, options so yeah. exactly right no one likes it because it requires people to compromise you know yeah. it could be it could be tied to um company size um whether in terms of revenue or of user base right could not apply to for-profit companies there are all sorts of ways of tailoring it um so as to um uh so as to provide users with some level of uh relief when you have um, uh, you know, defamatory, uh, uh, when, when, when you have serious defamatory or, or harassing content. What I object to in the Section 230 debate, um, or at least what I object to in those who defend Section 230 as it is, is they seem to view it as coterminous with the First Amendment. They, 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 they seem to view it as um, uh, instantiating First Amendment protections, and that without Section 230 would somehow be violating some fundamental principle of free expression, um, not the legal First Amendment protections, obviously, 
Um, but 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 that um, you know without Section 230 we'll have somehow betrayed the First Amendment. But the First Amendment never went so far as to protect what Section 230 has been read to protect. Yeah, although and, maybe in part that's because of Section 230's existence. We don't. I mean that that I think I think you're right to 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 comp, to make clear that um, there's nothing in existing First Amendment precedent that suggests that Section 230 was required by the First Amendment. But we also don't know, I, I mean, if Section 230 were completely repealed and there was therefore presumptive publisher liability or you know, maybe even, even with distributor liability, we don't know the types of genuine, like clean First Amendment arguments that a platform like Facebook or Google might make in that case. And they, it may have more traction than it would have for a traditional publisher who doesn't have to manage, um, you know, billions of of, of new of new posts uh, a year, right? Per, per, yeah, perhaps. I, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that Section 230 is just a policy choice. It's a defensible policy choice. Policy choice. Yeah. I understand where the policy choice comes from, but it's only one of a number of defensible policy choices. Yeah. That a but reasonable rights protecting society can choose to make. Right. So what? But so so what do you? So if Section two hundred and thirty were repealed, though, what would the First Amendment require, even using your first principles test? So if we want what's best for users and for society, I'd say that that might be different because some users may be really harassing of people who are not even on the platform, right? So users and and um, and uh, third parties, non-users alike, um, is Section two hundred and thirty good? you know, is, is, is Section 230 the right policy? I, I know you, you've already sort of said we don't have enough information and debate is really not nuanced right now. But given the information that we have, yeah, yeah. what would you say? Yeah, yeah, no, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so, so, so the question is, right, so Section 230 is repealed tomorrow and I'm a judge and I'm asked, you know, some, some, uh, uh, some case like Facebook v. Force comes up, right? Someone, someone yeah. sues Facebook for providing material support to a terrorist organization or, or rather to, you know, supporting a terrorist yeah. organization. And um, uh, um, what, I, what, I would, what I would probably do is I would probably apply some sort of relatively demanding proximate cause um, and um, uh, uh, knowledge uh, requirement um, so as to slowly shift the uh, slowly shift the um, uh, incentives for platforms to um, to um, to to stay in, ignorant. Part, well, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, to, I, I get where you're going. Go ahead. To, yeah, yeah. To to to, to increase to 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 slowly increase the incentive for those companies to um, uh, take user complaints uh, to take user complaints uh, uh, seriously. Right yeah. now, there there is a tricky question of how do you do that without incentivizing um, uh, ignorance, right? right? And so you have to develop yeah. um, some sense of um, uh, you, you know, it, look, t tort law has these sorts of um, uh, you know ostrich in this. I, I, I forget exactly what the what the what the name is, right? But you have the kind of like the ostrich defense at some point stops being available, right? Where right, right. Constructive knowledge is kind of a, it, yeah. it, it, exactly. But 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 my my point is this project, right? Like this project is kind of perfect for courts, right? This is the kind of yeah. pure common law process of taking your your most extreme cases first dealing with the outliers, slowly getting into the heartland, right? Now, this all assumes that Congress doesn't replace it with something else. Like a right? common carrier rule requirement or something like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. There, 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 are, there, are, there are many, many options um, yeah. here. I, I'm just trying to create the space for talking about alternatives without the sort of, you either have 230 or we shut the internet down tomorrow. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so the next thing you describe or discuss in the article are, is government surveillance. Uh, so this is sort of like a First Amendment and where, where First Amendment and Fourth Amendment actually kind of dovetail. <laughs> um, do you want to say anything about what you think a, a modern, you know, print, going back to first principles, what what the First Amendment might have to say about large platforms that wind up being the 
intermediary, <laughs> as you yourself might have called them. Yeah, yeah, yeah for, sure, sure. Yeah, one, for one government access. Call them, so it's like, it's, like they're, it's like they're intermediaries for surveillance. It's like they're surveillance, surveillance intermediaries. intermediaries. Right? Yeah, 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 that's what they're like. <laughs> that's that's, a, that's an article uh, by, uh, there's an article in Stanford Law Review by Alan called Surveillance Intermediaries. So uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm better at titles than I am at the actual article. Um, <laughs> no, well, so, 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 so the, the, the idea there is that um, technology companies have, have a number of roles to play when it comes to to surveillance and, and first amendment and 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 here there are some there is as you said some overlap between the first amendment and the fourth amendment right so um at minimum um technology companies have some role in notifying their users when the government is trying to surveil them so that those users can then object right now um you get conflicts where the government sometimes for legitimate reasons sometimes for not so legitimate reasons um, imposes a non-disclosure order on the company, otherwise known as a gag order. But a gag order, I find, kind of stacks the deck, right? And there are some non-disclosure orders that are totally reasonable and legitimate. For example, when you're doing an ongoing wiretap investigation and you can't tell Tony Soprano that you've bugged his basement, right? right. Uh, but other situations in which the government just like, you know, pro forma puts a five-year gag order for no obviously good reason. That's not so good. So I think there are some situations in which a company could, invoking its users' constitutional rights, and here it's you know, is it the Fourth Amendment right? Is it the First Amendment right with respect to communication? It's a little less clear, um, but I do think that there is a colorable argument that a tech company should, in some cases, be able to sue the government, invoking its users' rights to inform those users. And then we could have a conversation about whether, in that particular case, the government's interest in non-disclosure to the user uh, outweighs the uh, users' um, the users' uh, 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 interests. Right. Mm -hmm. And here you have, I think, a, a classic example of taking user interests first, right? It's not that the company has a right to notify its users. It's that the company is acting on behalf of the, the users agent. to vindicate yeah. the user's rights, yeah. exactly, right? And, and, and then you have you know, a similar thing, for example, when companies, and Twitter has done this, uh, and Microsoft have both done this um, quite successfully, um, uh, resisting government requests to um, identify pseudonymous accounts. And this has happened a couple of times with Twitter, especially during the Trump administration, because you had these parody accounts, making fun of DHS, making fun of um, uh, uh, um, Representative Nunes. Um, um, and uh, the government would send subpoenas to Twitter saying, I'd like to know who this parody DHS account is. And Twitter said, no, our, our users have a First Amendment right to speak anonymously. Right. right. And right. Okay, so they're standing in the shoes of their users when they do that. Exactly. That I think is great. Right. I, I welcome those kinds of lawsuits. The problem is, I think it's really important to distinguish those kinds of lawsuits from when the companies make their own First Amendment arguments against cooperating with the government. And that I think is much more problematic. And I think for me, the perfect example of this and the most famous example of this is when Apple um, resisted unlocking the F the iPhone of the San Bernardino shooter back in 2016 uh, and resisted a court order that the FBI got to, to that would require Apple to write some computer code that would you know help the FBI and Apple's argument they made many arguments they made a lot of statutory arguments but the co main constitutional argument they made was that because code is speech right, which is a different thing we can talk about which I will. I, that's yeah, yeah, where yeah. I was going next. Yeah, Go exactly. ahead. Yeah, forcing <laughs> Apple to write computer code to unlock the iPhone is akin to forcing Apple to express a substantive political position, which is that it is legitimate or appropriate for a company to help the FBI get into its devices. And because Apple doesn't think that that's legitimate, right? The FBI request is equivalent to compelled speech in violation of Apple's First Amendment rights. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of argument has to be rejected basically in, in, in its entirety, right? That there can be no room in our modern economy for a company to say that um, it does not have to comply with government regulation because that government regulation requires writing code um, and, the, and the company disagrees with the underlying premise of the government regulation. Right. Yeah. Do you do, would you would you say you know given the um, connection that you're looking at between the company and its users, would you look to cases that are about um, c compelling passwords? You know that that type of Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment case. Would you uh, when when the defendant is the actual user? Um, are those a good guide for what Apple should or should not be doing in a situation like the one with the San Bernardino iPhone? 
So, so if, if, well, so in the San Bernardino iPhone case, it's a little odd because the defendant was dead, right? right. Um, the, the, the owner of the, so the, the, there was no, there was no one's rights that could be violated except for kind of the theoretical rights of other Apple users who might or might not be impacted negatively, which was Apple's claim, right? And I'm, yeah, I'm but, but if he was alive and he was a criminal defendant, um, there would, I mean, so they would, they would be able to, I mean, first of all, they did in fact have a warrant to access all of his, yeah. his data. Um, would they be able to compel him though, to give a password? So, so in those under, cases, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So under the fifth amendment, they might not be able to, right. Yeah. But the, that issue would not be a problem. So let, let, let's assume the, def, yeah. So, okay. So let's assume the defendant was alive, right. Uh, the defendant's refusing to cooperate. And so the cops go to Apple. So Apple, I think should be able to make the following arguments in principle, right? whether they win or not is a different question, but like these following arguments strike me as reasonable. One, we will not do this because this violates our, our customers' fourth amendment rights, right? Show us a warrant. Okay, but the government had a warrant. We have a warrant, yeah. <laughs> we will not do this because this violates our, our defendants' fifth amendment rights. In principle, that's possible. The problem is the whole point of the Fifth Amendment right of self-incrimination is that it's about self-incrimination. The Fifth Amendment right is an interesting one is that it is specifically limited yeah. right, to the government forcing you to incriminate yourself, right? Mm -hmm. But here, if you go to a third party, that again might be a Fourth Amendment violation, but it cannot be a Fifth Amendment violation Amendment. of yeah. self-incrimination. Yeah. Yeah. Or the first Amendment argument that Apple, I think, could have made, and like if you read, if you squint really hard at the brief, you can sort of get a sense that this is maybe what they're going for. And folks like Neil Richards and Andrew Woods kind of made this argument for them much better at the time, which is, look, in order for our users to want to use our products and to therefore use our products to communicate with each other, they have to trust that our products are always going to act in their interest and that they're not going to be um, used as vectors for government surveillance. Therefore, if you force us to do this, it will so irreparably harm user trust in our product that it will overall undermine users' communication, right? Um, yeah. now, Although that same argument I, can, can be used to challenge even an ordinary wiretap as well. So I get that, that even that logic only goes so far, but... <laughs> but, but, but at least yeah. that logic is focusing on in my opinion, what matters, which is the rights of the users, right? right? Yeah. Um, I could also imagine if, if the government had gotten a order from the court to compel, you know, Sally, a particular engineer at Apple, who, who is the one who knows most about the iPhone to write the computer code, Sally could say, look, I have a First Amendment right not to write computer code with which I disagree. Right. Okay. Okay. So you even see that first. You even see that first amendment. Maybe. Yeah. Right. Maybe. That. that okay. Yeah. Right. But when but it's to, Apple... to a corporation. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, I do want to go to the code is speech uh, topic for a second because because um, it's these types of cases, especially Bernstein and Corley type cases, where groups like the EFF have been most have, have quite vociferously ad advocated for treating you know treating code and the companies that do make it as speech slash speakers uh, and it has always struck me as bizarrely short-sighted for the same for, for these for these um not you know nonprofit organizations because it only takes like a second for the same argument to be used against their you know, typical uh, cases or clients, like where if, if they think that there should be, for example, strong privacy guarantees for people who use Google or whatnot, um, then the exact same code equals speech argument can be used by Google and against the EFF's interest. So, um, so yeah, so how do you, where do you see the line in terms of both the act of coding or the code itself, whether it's source code or executed code, um, and uh, and the scope of the First Amendment. Sure, and and I, I think part of part of the problem is that um, I think the holding of Bernstein. So it's a little complicated because like the Bernstein cases were withdrawn, and so they're not actually valid law in the Ninth Circuit. But like the the so we talk about the Bernstein cases, we're really talking about the general consensus since the mid '90s of about the status of code, right? And when we say code is speech, what we really mean, and here I think is the, is the um, uh, relatively benign uh, view of the law, that code isn't necessarily not speech. I think that's right. the way to that's, think about that it. That is right? what, that's it's, what it's, I mean. It's, it's, it's <laughs> not that every bit of code 
you know, is equivalent to giving a speech on the sidewalk. It's that just because something is code, even just because something is machine code, which is to say the zeros and ones that the you know central processing unit of your computer actually um, uh, actually uh, uh, runs, yeah. just because it's code doesn't mean it's not speech, right? right? Just in the same way that just because you know something's a melody, right? A wordless melody doesn't necessarily mean it's not speech or a piece of abstract art isn't necessarily not speech, right? But that doesn't mean that every piece of code is speech in the same way that every, you know, time you throw Sound. a paint bucket against a wall, it's speech, right? right? You have to look <laughs> at underlying what's going on. And, and I think this gets back yeah. to your original question about, you know, rules versus standards. And I think this is a perfect example of where if, if you're trying too hard to derive the answer of when is computer code speech from existing First Amendment doctrine in kind of a mechanical way, you, you get into these problems because it's just different, right? The doctrine needs updating. And the only way to do that is to go back to first principles. So what are the first principles? Well, what are we trying to do? We're trying to allow people to communicate with each other, right? Like that's the purpose of the First Amendment, right? Okay, so let's just decide that the you know such code that allows for communication between people, right, um, is... Uh, is speech, right, um, that is subject to the First Amendment protection, recognizing that um, uh, even when it comes to regular speech, we don't allow literally every kind of speech to be First Amendment protected because then we couldn't run our society, right? So, you know, if I scream into your ear um, and, you know, you know, cause you hearing loss, well, we're not going to call that speech, even though, like, that was a form of communication, I guess we're going to call that assault, Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you have we have to draw some lines now. How to how to do it? That's tricky, right? And different people have drawn the lines differently. And so you know, there's a there's a great uh, it's a pretty good piece by uh, 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 Professor Tim Wu called Machine Speech, um, which is you know trying to get this tr try, trying to get at this at this um, uh, at this distinction of you know when you're just using a, a, a machine um, for its function um, that. Yeah is not speech. I don't, know, I don't know if that's exactly the right line, line to draw. Um, but um, uh, mostly I would just say that um, very few cases should ever turn on the question of whether or not code is speech, right? Yeah, I think yeah. instead we should say, just because it's code doesn't mean it's not speech, right? Mm -hmm. And then we but say- ask, Ultimately it's about communicating between people. It, it, exactly, it, ex yeah. exactly. And so in the Apple yeah. case, I'm perfectly happy to say that like, okay, fine, if you really want to call like what Apple was being asked to write speech, like, okay, but is the speech from Apple headquarters computer to a particular iPhone for this purpose, does that offend the first amendment? And to me, the answer is does not because I don't think it has much of an impact on communication relative to the interests that the government had at that time, which was, I think, a fairly compelling right. anti-terrorism concern. Right. I mean, sometimes analogies really are useful if, 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 you know, I, I think, you know, Apple sort of portrayed the, I'm sorry, the government sort of portrayed this as like asking a locksmith to create a new key or something like that. And that, that physicality of it or something, I mean, the analogy, it, it holds up a little bit to me. Okay, so last question, because um, I want to do, I do want to give at least a few minutes uh, opportunity for attendees to ask questions. Um, relates to, you also mentioned in your article, the kind of addiction or consumer protection angle uh, that might be coming down the pipeline soon of treating certain types of online engagement as harmful because of its um, addictive or crazy making <laughs> quality. How so that to me seems to run directly against though, the general principle that if people are trying to communicate with each other, that's at the core of what the first amendment is trying to protect. So how, how do you see, I know this wasn't core to, to, to your article, um, but, but how would you, you know, at what point does a willing speaker and a willing listener who are engaged in speech that is not one of the categories of unprotected speech, right? At what point can we say that they're doing too much of it or that it's, uh, it's not actually good for their long-term interests or that, that sort of thing? Yeah, so I mean, th this is a perennial problem in um, consumer protection law, right? And there are whole bodies of law that exist to figure out, you know, can the government require certain types of packaging? Can the government require certain types of disclosures? 
Um, can the government require that, you know, when a company sell drugs, the warnings are in a specifically big enough font, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. These aren't easy questions, but I don't think they, I don't think we tend to get, to, and, and they do sometimes raise real First Amendment questions. But I think generally there's an appreciation that this is a matter of everyone trying to be pretty reasonable, which is to say that, you know, we don't want to let um, companies, um, uh, you know, defraud or otherwise hoodwink consumers. But on the other hand, we don't, we do, we do want to, you know, generally err on the side of people getting to talk to one another, right? So how does that all apply in, in this case? Um, so, uh, you know, I think that, you um, whether it's social media or the coming metaverse, um, I think this raises huge and like underappreciated concerns of things like addiction, things like crazy making, mm -hmm. right? Um, in a way that not only is bad for people generally, but itself might be bad for speech, right? Because, you know, the point of the First Amendment, as I understand it, is not just to encourage people to scream at each other as loudly as possible in the public square. Um, right, it, it, it is to allow people to, to um, not just hear, but process information in ways that is useful to them, right? And sometimes that requires people being, um, people being protected, right? So let me give you a real world example, right? Every time I go at, you know, I, at my local gas station, when I fill up the pump, um, the, the stupid TV screen on the gas station is like yelling a commercial at me, right? This happened in the last yeah. five years. Um, so on the one hand, that's good for speech because I get to hear another thing. It's usually something stupid, right? But like theoretically, it's more speech. On the other hand, like that's five minutes where I can't think, right? Because instead of just, you know, yep. pumping gas and like getting to like daydream for 90 seconds, someone's trying to sell me a burrito, yeah. right? So um, I could imagine, right, a, um, a, uh, um, a, a regulation that said, right, you cannot just blare at people without their permission, right? Um, and we could then have a discussion about whether or not we thought that that was, um, that that kind of promoted either, you know, speech in a general sense or other interests in ways that did not offend the First Amendment, right? Or we could decide in some cases that that would be, you know, um, uh, 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 prior restraint and not permitted, right? But we can have that conversation, right? In I some ways though, that is even easier than the question of whether to limit social media access for teenagers, for example, because at least with the blur, I hate that, by the way, I think about it every time I go to a gas station, that at least the loud commercials that are, are yelling at you while you're pumping your gas. Um, at least you could be described as an unwilling listener, an unwilling thinker or whatnot. What, what strikes me as difficult with a lot of the, not just social media, but you're right. I, I think we need to start be thinking about metaverse, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality is that is the time inconsistent nature of people's desires, right? So, in the short term, people want people are willing listeners, but in the long term or their higher self, it's not, you know, it, 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 even they would would describe themselves as wanting something different, and that that seems to me really challenging for a especially as long as we have a libertarian conception of a First Amendment also that assumes that you know government line drawing should stay away when it gets in the way of a willing speaker and a willing listener, it seems like that's even more difficult than the case you're describing right now. Do you agree with that? Oh, no, oh, to, to, totally, right? And, and the question is, so there, 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 so there, there, there are two, 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 two things that make this complicated, right? One is different people have different conceptions of the First Amendment, right? Different people have mm -hmm. different commitments to a more or less libertarian conception of the First Amendment, right? And this is yeah. based on the underlying priors, blah, 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 right? Yeah. But also different people have different conceptions of what the underlying um, social reality is. Right, so um, one can be a pretty hardcore First Amendment libertarian, and therefore think that like we shouldn't have any restrictions on what you can see on, you know, we shouldn't have any regulation of the cable TV industry, but look at Facebook's latest Metaverse video and think, oh, this is something new, right? You know, this is now going to become such an immersive and potentially addictive experience that even though I'm a hardcore libertarian about the First Amendment, even I understand that um, you know normal human beings don't stand a chance to you know, algorithmically optimized VR, and therefore we have to create some structures so as to help people's higher selves, um, as, it, as it were. To me, I think 
access for children is an interesting test case here, right? Um, you know, it is crazy to me, and I say this as, an, as a new father, right, who um, is kind of thinking with terror 10 years from now when my kid <laughs> wants their first microchip. VR set, yeah. Right. yeah VR <laughs> micro, but whatever, yeah, however we're all going to be jacked into the matrix. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the idea that Facebook is allowed Facebook owns Instagram, I think. Yeah, Facebook owns everything. The idea that like Facebook slash Instagram is allowed to have Instagram for kids is completely insane to me, right? And um, you know, uh, uh, if the government wa wanted to, you know, were to 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 ban that or to put serious restrictions on that, right? That to me would be a nice kind of case study or a nice um, test case for um, allowing that to go through, right? Um, not viewing that as a First Amendment violation because on the other side of the issue is the ability of children's, you know, mental lives to develop in some mm -hmm. way that's not algorithmically mediated constantly, which is its own speech benefit. And then we can sort of see if that works, uh, wor works enough. But, you know, and I'm just going to come back to a, a point, I know we're, we're running low on time. I just want to kind of come back to a point at the beginning, right? There is no, to me, substitute for coming to terms with the fact mm -hmm. that a lot of this is new and there needs to be experimentation. I feel like a lot of First Amendment law a lot of First Amendment scholarship and commentary is so petrified with deviating from existing First Amendment principles um, and is trying so hard to find clear rules that will just tell you the right answer that it isn't essentially denial of the fact that we are dealing with a, te te you know, a telecommunications revolution, not quite at the level of um, uh, you know, the printing press, but certainly at the level of the radio. I, I think it might be at the level of the printing press. Maybe. I, I mean, I guess we don't know. We're we're like, <laughs> yeah, who, we're who still knows? like within a gener. We're still in Gutenberg's generation, so who knows? Exactly. But there's no there's no reason to think that the that the Supreme Court got it all right in the mid 20th century when it or in the 20th century when yeah, it created yeah. our first amendment framework. So right. like, yeah. I, I think you got to burn some of this down and just like start rebuilding it from scratch. Otherwise, it's just going to yeah. be. So, so my last comment, and then I'll, I'll see if anyone. Uh, wants to chime in, but I, on one hand, I'm very sympathetic to the, what you're saying here, but it makes me incredibly nervous because of the, because the factions and the um, simplification of the story of what's going on happens almost immediately, um, or rather it, 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 it you know, pe people have very strong theories of what the internet is or is not doing to us. Uh, that um, that is way beyond the state of research and and you know knowledge of of, of I think you know more uh, cautious and careful researchers um, and and because of that I think you know the the libertarian conception of the First Amendment hinges on the idea that those in power will use that power to characterize facts the way they want them to be um, and you know whether it's with you know, whether they fully realize it or not, the consequences of the of the legislation or the regulation that they might impose could be very bad for society. And so so I guess in addition to the rules versus standards problem that everything boils down to, the other problem that everything boils down to is how to trust a how to trust the government or to what extent. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, every every question is a who guards the guardians question. Yeah, that's no, right. I, I, I think the public, I think the public choice. You know, call them public choice or political economy yeah. objections to my account are, are are very serious. They're very strong, yeah. right? And um, you, you know, I, I I think if if we were uh, if 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 my view of the First Amendment adopted, which I have no reason it's going to happen anytime soon, and there was created space for government regulation, you'd have to think really hard about what sort that would that would be. Now, yeah. um, I I think that um, um, my account is compatible with a strong presumption against government censorship, right? So not all government regulations of the internet to me are created equal, right? So the, the, the back third of my article is an analysis of the uh, recent Florida social media law um, that was meant to stop internet big tech quote unquote censorship of conservatives, right? Um, and while I have lots of problems with that law and I have lots of problems with Ron DeSantis and I think a lot of it's in bad faith, right? Um, I think that the reflexive, oh my God, the, inter the government's trying to control the internet objection to that law from a lot of civil libertarians was misplaced. And there's a big difference between laws in which the government says you have to carry certain types of speech versus laws that say you cannot carry certain types of speech, right? Now, that doesn't mean that all 
of the former type are okay. Um, right. But there's a difference when the government tries to increase speech than when it tries to restrict it, right? Um, and so I'm very comfortable saying, um, look, um, on the merits, I don't think that, you know, um, we should uh, treat the First Amendment rights of platforms, particularly sancrescently, um, but we should also um, have a very strong presumption against um, any government attempts to um, censor content, right? And so, for example, recent proposals by, I think, some Democrats to um, uh, pass laws policing health misinformation um, are really problematic for reasons that, that Jeff Kosev has explained uh, uh, quite well um, on, on Twitter. Um, uh, so, so that, so I, I think, I think that there, there are ways to finesse the points you're, you're, you're making. But at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. Like at the end of the day, if you are going to let the government interfere in the market, right? Which, by the way, it already does in a million other ways, right? So you're just kind of choosing which ways it's going to interfere. You can have problems. But I, you know, I, I think if you take that argument too far, it, it's 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 hard. I think it's you don't want to paralyze the government from acting because of that fear, right? I mean, you could, you could say the same argument about environmental law, right? Is our environmental law perfect? Absolutely not. Is there a lot of nonsense and rent seeking and um, interest group lobbying and inefficiency? 100%. Mm -hmm. But we also don't uh, have poisoned rivers or poisoned air anymore in this country. Yeah, so, that's true. Although, although our understanding of the harms from environmental law are much more sophisticated, are, are much First of all, they're, they're, they're just we've been studying it for longer. There's much more uh, consensus is not quite the right word. I mean, there's much more almost universal consensus basically on on a, at least um, the direction of the of the effects of certain toxins and whatnot. Um, so I still think I don't know. Well, okay, <laughs> got it. So this is <laughs> that's that's the question. I, or, we'll I don't know. Give I mean, give give the FTC a billion dollars and have them start doing research. Right. Well, I would love if the FTC did research. Yeah, I would love that. But that, but that's not how they use their energy. I mean, maybe that's even a good case study. Is how, what is is um is the FTC's um you know it, it, that that's an, an example of an organization that is not reluctant to just ride one theory of of harm well beyond what evidence shows and and you know intervene with 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 pretty significant regulation. Um, look, look, I will concede your point that there are a lot of really difficult public choice institutional design questions here. Yeah. Um, um, uh, I mean, I think that's I think that's I think that's totally fair. I'm just trying to like get people to, in principle, stop taking such a binary view of the First Amendment when it comes when it comes to this and realize that, like, at the end of the day, these are policy choices, just like any other policy choices. And usually the answer is not on the super extreme poll. Right here, here. OK, great. Well, I think we better wrap it up because we're already uh, beyond our 45 minute time uh, and I don't see questions in the Q&A, but I cannot thank you enough, Alan. Always a pleasure and I hope to see you soon. Thanks for having me.